Book 3, Chapters 1 through 3 of The Wars of the Jews. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 3, A Description of Galilee, Samaria, and Judea. Now Phoenicia and Syria encompass about the Galilees, which are two, and call the Upper Galilee and the Lower. They are bounded toward the setting sun, with the borders of the territory belonging to Ptolemaeus and by Carmel, which mountain had formerly belonged to the Galileans, but now belonged to the Tyrians, to which mountain adjoins Gava, which is called the city of horsemen, because those horsemen that were dismissed by Herod the king dwelt therein. They are bounded on the south with Samaria and Scythopolis, as far as the river Jordan, on the east with Hippie and Gadarus, and also with Ganlanitis, and the borders of the kingdom of Agrippa. Its northern parts are bounded by Tyre and the country of the Tyrians. As for that Galilee, which is called the Lower, it extends in length from Tiberias to Zabulon, and of the maritime places Ptolemaeus is its neighbor. Its breadth is from the village called Zalath, which lies on the Great Plain, as far as Bersabe, from which beginning also is taken the breadth of Upper Galilee, as far as the village of Baca, which divides the land of the Tyrians from it. Its length is also from Meloth to Thela, a village near to Jordan. These two Galilees, of so great largeness, and encompassed with so many nations of foreigners, have always been able to make a strong resistance on all occasions of war, for the Galileans are inured to war from their infancy, and have been always very numerous, nor hath the country been ever destitute of men of courage, or wanted a numerous set of them, for their soil is universally rich and fruitful, and full of the plantations of trees of all sorts, insomuch that it invites the most slothful to take pains in its cultivation by its fruitfulness. Accordingly, it is all cultivated by its inhabitants, and no part of it lies idle. Moreover, the cities lie here very thick, and the very many villages there are here are everywhere so full of people, by the richness of their soil, that the very least of them contain above 15,000 inhabitants. In short, if anyone will suppose that Galilee is inferior to Peria in magnitude, he will be obliged to prefer it before it in its strength. For this is all capable of cultivation and is everywhere fruitful. But for Peria, which is indeed much larger in extent, the greater part of it is desert and rough, and much less disposed for the production of the milder kinds of fruits. Yet hath it a moist soil in other parts, and produces all kinds of fruits, and its plains are planted with trees of all sorts, while yet the olive tree, the vine, and the palm tree are chiefly cultivated there. It is also sufficiently watered with torrents, which issue out of the mountains, and with springs that never fail to run, even when the torrents fail them, as they do in the dog days. Now the length of Peria is from Macarus to Pella, and its breadth from Philadelphia to Jordan. Its northern parts are bounded by Pella, as we have already said, as well as its western with Jordan. The land of Moab is its southern border, and its eastern limits reach to Arabia, and Silbonitus, and besides, to Philadelphine and Gerasa. Now as to the country of Samaria, it lies between Judea and Galilee. It begins at a village that is in the great plain called Guinea, and ends at the Acrabine Toparchy, and is entirely of the same nature with Judea for both countries are made up of hills and valleys, and are moist enough for agriculture, and are very fruitful. They have abundance of trees, and are full of autumnal fruit, both that which grows wild, and that which is the effect of cultivation. They are not naturally watered by many rivers, but derive their chief moisture from rainwater, of which they have no want. And for those rivers which they have, all their waters are exceedingly sweet, by reason also of the excellent grass they have, their cattle yield more milk than do those in other places. And what is the greatest sign of excellency and of abundance, they each of them are very full of people. In the limits of Samaria and Judea lies the village of Anuath, which is also named Borchius. This is the northern boundary of Judea, 
The southern parts of Judea, if they be measured lengthways, are bounded by a village adjoining to the confines of Arabia. The Jews that dwell there call it Jordan. However, its breadth is extended from the river Jordan to Joppa. The city Jerusalem is situated in the very middle, on which account some have, with sagacity enough, called that city the navel of the country. Nor indeed is Judea destitute of such delights as come from the sea, since its maritime places extend as far as Ptolemais. It was parted into eleven portions, of which the royal city Jerusalem was the supreme, and presided over all the neighboring country as the head does over the body. As to the other cities that were inferior to it, they presided over their several toparchies. Gophna was the second of these cities, and next to that Akrabata, after them Thamna, and Lydda, and Emmaus, and Pella, and Idumea, and Engadi, and Herodium, and Jericho. And after them came Jamnia and Joppa, as presiding over the neighboring people. And besides these, there was the region of Gamala, and Galanitus, and Batania, and Trachonitus, which are also parts of the kingdom of Agrippa. This last country begins at Mount Libanus, and the foundations of Jordan, and reaches breathways to the lake of Tiberias, and in length is extended from a village called Arpha, as far as Julius. Its inhabitants are a mixture of Jews and Syrians. And thus have I, with all possible brevity, described the country of Judea, and those that lie round about it. Book 5, Chapters 3 and 4 of The Wars of the Jews. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Hollis Hanover. Chapter 4 The Description of Jerusalem. 1. The city of Jerusalem was fortified with three walls on such parts as were not encompassed with unpassable valleys, for in such places it had but one wall. The city was built upon two hills which are opposite to one another, and have a valley to divide them asunder, at which valley the corresponding rows of houses on both hills end. Of these hills, that which contains the upper city is much higher, and in length more direct. Accordingly, it was called the citadel by King David. He was the father of that Solomon who built this temple at the first but it is by us called the upper marketplace. But the other hill, which was called Acra, and sustains the lower city, is of the shape of a moon when she is horned. Over against this there was a third hill, but naturally lower than Acra, and parted formerly from the other by a broad valley. However, in those times when the Asamoneans reigned, they filled up that valley with earth, and had a mind to join the city to the temple. They then took off part of the height of Acre and reduced it to be of less elevation than it was before, that the temple might be superior to it. Now the valley of the cheesemongers, as it was called, and was that which we told you before distinguished the hill of the upper city from that of the lower, extended as far as Siloam, for that is the name of the fountain which hath sweet water in it, and this in great plenty also. But on the outsides these hills are surrounded by deep valleys, and by reason of the precipices to them belonging on both sides, they are everywhere unpassable. 2. Now of these three walls the old one was hard to be taken both by reason of the valleys and of the hill on which it was built, and which was above them. But besides that great advantage as to the place where they were situated, it was also built very strong, because David and Solomon and the following kings were very zealous about this work. Now that wall began on the north at the tower called Hippicus, and extended as far as the Zistus, a place so called, and then joining to the council house, ended at the west cloister of the temple. But if we go the other way westward, it began at the same place, and extended through a place called Bethso, to the gate of the Essens. And after that it went southward, having its bending above the fountain Siloam, 
where it also bends again toward the east at Solomon's Pool, and reaches as far as a certain place which they called Ophlus, where it was joined to the eastern cloister of the temple. The second wall took its beginning from that gate which they call Jenneth, which belonged to the first wall. It only encompassed the northern quarter of the city, and reached as far as the Tower Antonia. The beginning of the third wall was at the Tower Hippicus, whence it reached as far as the north quarter of the city, and the Tower Cephanus, and then was so far extended till it came over against the monuments of Helena, which Helena was queen of Adiabene, the daughter of Isates. It then extended further to a greater length, and passed by the sepulchral caverns of the kings, and bent again at the tower of the corner, at the monument which is called Monument of the Fuller, and joined to the old wall at the valley called the Valley of Cedron. It was Agrippa who encompassed the parts added to the old city with this wall, which had been all naked before. For as the city grew more populous, it gradually crept beyond its old limits, and those parts of it that stood northward of the temple, and joined that hill to the city, made it considerably larger, and occasioned that hill, which is in number the fourth, and is also called Bezetha, to be inhabited also. It lies over against the tower Antonia, but is divided from it by a deep valley which was dug on purpose, and that in order to hinder the foundations of the tower of Antonia from joining to this hill, and thereby affording an opportunity for getting to it with ease, and hindering the security that arose from its superior elevation. For which reason also that depth of the ditch made the elevation of the towers more remarkable. This new-built part of the city was called Bezetha, in our language, which, if interpreted in the Grecian language, may be called the New City. Since, therefore, its inhabitants stood in need of a covering, the father of the present king, and of the same name with him, Agrippa, began the wall we spoke of, but he left off building it when he had only laid the foundations, out of the fear he was in of Claudius Caesar lest he should suspect that so strong a wall was built in order to make some innovation in public affairs. For the city could no way have been taken if that wall had been finished in the manner it was begun, as its parts were connected together by stones twenty cubits long and ten cubits broad, which could never have been easily either undermined by any iron tools or shaken by any engines. The wall was, however, ten cubits wide, and it would probably have had a height greater than that had not his zeal who began it been hindered from exerting itself. After this it was erected with great diligence by the Jews, as high as twenty cubits, above which it had battlements of two cubits, and turrets of three cubits altitude insomuch that the entire altitude extended as far as twenty-five cubits. 3. Now the towers that were upon it were twenty cubits in breadth and twenty cubits in height. They were square and solid, as was the wall itself, were in the niceness of the joints and the beauty of the stones were no way inferior to those of the holy house itself. Above this solid altitude of the towers, which was twenty cubits, there were rooms of great magnificence, and over them upper rooms, and cisterns to receive rainwater. They were many in number, and the steps by which you ascended up to them were every one broad. Of these towers then the third wall had ninety, and the spaces between them were each two hundred cubits. But in the middle walls were forty towers, and the old wall was parted into sixty, while the whole compass of the city was thirty-three furlongs. Now the third wall was all of it wonderful, yet was the tower Cephanus elevated above it at the northwest corner, and there Titus pitched his own tent, for being seventy cubits high it both afforded a prospect of Arabia at sunsetting, as well as it did of the utmost limits of the Hebrew possessions at the sea westward. 
Moreover, it was an octagon, and over against it was the tower Hippolycus, and hard by two others were erected by King Herod in the old wall. These were for largeness, beauty, and strength beyond all that were in the habitable earth. For besides the magnanimity of his nature and his magnificence toward the city on other occasions, he built these after such an extraordinary manner to gratify his own private affections, and dedicated these towers to the memory of those three persons who had been the dearest to him, and from whom he named them. They were his brother, his friend, and his wife. This wife he had slain out of his love and jealousy, as we have already related. The other two he lost in war, as they were courageously fighting. Hippicus, so named from his friend, was square. Its length and breadth were each twenty-five cubits, and its height thirty, and it had no vacuity in it. Over this solid building, which was composed of great stones united together, there was a reservoir twenty cubits deep, over which there was a house of two stories, whose height was twenty-five cubits, and divided into several parts, over which were battlements of two cubits, and turrets all around of three cubits high, insomuch that the entire height added together amounted to fourscore cubits. The second tower, which he named from his brother Phasilus, had its breadth and its height equal, each of them forty cubits, over which was its solid height of forty cubits, over which a cloister went round about, whose height was ten cubits, and it was covered from enemies by a breastwork and bulwarks. There was also built over that cloister another tower, parted into magnificent rooms, and a place for bathing, so that this tower wanted nothing that might make it appear to be a royal palace. It was adorned also with battlements and turrets, more than was the foregoing, and the entire altitude was about ninety cubits. The appearance of it resembled the tower of Ferris, which exhibited a fire to such as sailed to Alexandria, but this was much larger than it in compass. This was now converted into a house wherein Simon exercised his tyrannical authority. The third tower was Mariamne, for that was his queen's name. It was solid as high as twenty cubits. Its breadth and its length were twenty cubits, and were equal to each other. Its upper buildings were more magnificent, and had greater variety than the other towers had, for the king thought it most proper for him to adorn that which was denominated from his wife, better than those denominated from men, as those were built stronger than this which bore his wife's name. The entire height of this tower was fifty cubits. 4. Now as these towers were also very tall, they appeared much taller by the place on which they stood. For that very old wall wherein they were built was on a high hill, and was itself a kind of elevation that was still thirty cubits taller over which were the towers situated, and, and thereby were made much higher to appearance. The largeness also of the stones was wonderful, for they were not made of common small stones, nor of such large ones only as men could carry, but they were of white marble cut out of the rock. Each stone was twenty cubits in length, and ten in breadth, and five in depth. They were so exactly united to one another, that each tower looked like one entire rock of stone, so growing naturally, and afterward cut by the hand of the artificers into their present shape and corners. So little or not at all did their joints or connection appear. Low as these towers were themselves on the north side of the wall, the king had a palace inwardly thereto joined, which exceeds all my ability to describe it, for it was so very curious as to want no cost nor skill in its construction, but was entirely walled about to the height of thirty cubits, and was adorned with towers at equal distances, and with large bedchambers that would contain beds for a hundred guests apiece, in which the variety of the stones is not to be expressed, for a large quantity of those that were rare of that kind were collected together. 
Their roofs were also wonderful, both for the length of the beams and the splendor of their ornaments. The number of the rooms was also very great, and the variety of the figures that were about them was prodigious. Their furniture was complete, and the greatest part of the vessels that were put in them was of silver and gold. There were besides many porticos, one beyond another, round about, and in each of these porticos curious pillars. Yet were all the courts that were exposed to the air everywhere green. There were, moreover, several groves of trees and long walks through them with deep canals and cisterns, that in several parts were filled with brazen statues, through which the water ran out. There were with all many dove courts of tame pigeons about the canals. Footnote. These dove courts in Josephus, built by Herod the Great, are, in the opinion of Reland, the very same that are mentioned by the Talmudists and named by them Herod's dove courts. Nor is there any reason to suppose otherwise, since in both accounts they were expressly tame pigeons which were kept in them. And footnote. But indeed it is not possible to give a complete description of these palaces, and the very remembrance of them is a torment to one, as putting one in mind what vastly rich buildings that fire which was kindled by the robbers has consumed. For these were not burnt by the Romans, but by these internal plotters, as we have already related in the beginning of their rebellion. That fire began at the tower of Antonia, and went on to the palaces, and consumed the upper parts of the three towers themselves. End of Book 5, Chapters 3 and 4, Recording by Hollis Hanover